often have conversation uh, because NOAA is interested in going beyond forecasting weather events and trying to forecast biological and ecological event, events like harmful algal blooms. So we're looking at how uh, what the resources are in Alaska that exist that could be better coordinated to do that now, and then um, looking at where we need to go in the future with investment to make that kind of thing possible. So. Um, I'm very excited that we've got um, some folks on the line today that um, can really provide a, a great introduction to the issue of harmful algal blooms and how Alaska is struggling with it right now. Um, in Alaska, we have a, a harm, Alaska Harmful Algal Bloom Network, and Kayla Schomer, who is a fellow with uh, Sea Grant uh, and the Alaska Ocean Observing System, is going to introduce you to AHAB. Um, it began in 2017, and it's a uh, uh, a means to coordinate research on HAB in Alaska. Alaska is a huge state with several different regions that approach this issue differently. And so AHAB is uh, trying to um, improve coordination across the state. Um, we also have um, Gay Sheffield on the line. She's a Marine Advisory Program agent with uh, Alaska Sea Grant based in Nome. And in the Bering Strait region, um, they're um, really struggling with this issue uh, on a daily basis in the summertime at this point. We know that um, water temperature is increasing in the region dramatically, and we know that the risks of um, blooms of the species of plankton that can produce toxins that cause things like paralytic shellfish poisoning respond to uh, increasing water temperature. There's a threshold and they bloom um, when the temperature reaches that threshold. And um, with the water temperature changes we've been seeing up north, we know that that risk is increasing. And Don Anderson is on the line. Uh, he's with Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. Uh, he and others on the line from Hui are um, experts in um, trying to monitor and forecast for HABs in the Gulf of Maine on the East Coast. And he's been doing some work recently in Alaska, and hopefully he'll introduce you to uh, what we know about the risks in the Alaska marine environment now. We also have Kathy Lefebvre from NOAA. She's um, working on um, looking at how the toxins associated with HAB events are um, transferred through the food web, and she's um, doing some great work to sample various aspects of the food web. There's um, other folks throughout the country as well. I don't know if Steve Kibler's on the line. He's also doing a project uh, funded by the North Pacific Research Board, and we're looking for toxins in um, fish and marine mammals, et cetera, and how <clears throat> these uh, events may pose um, <clears throat> broader ecological threat to the environment. Um, let's see. Um, and then what, we, what we'd like to do is, um, after we hear from our invited speakers who are going to introduce the issue, one of the things I'd like us to try to get to during the discussion is how can those of us on the phone with their uh, expertise in various disciplines potentially work together to try to help advance Alaska's capacity for forecasting HAB events. So, um, we are really lacking basic data um, for large areas of Alaska that would be needed to try to produce a forecast. So um, Don may be able to introduce us to what some of the basic parameters are that you would need to develop a forecast, and then we can look at where we're lacking those in Alaska. Um, and we can, I think, think at a, a basic level about how, for example, um, folks that are working on um, sea ice and modeling of sea ice and interactions with the marine environment might be able to help us predict things like a temperature uh, threshold and stratification um, conditions in the marine environment to at least give us an early warning of when you might potentially see the highest risk of um, these plankton species blooming to at least um, give us a start. Um, so I think that's all I'll say by means of introduction to give us um, plenty of time for our guest speakers and discussion. Um, and so uh, at this point, I uh, believe I'll introduce Kayla Schomer. Is that right, Meredith? Um, Kayla's, okay. So um, Kayla's uh, a Sea Grant Fellow with the Alaska Ocean Observing System, and she's going to introduce us to the Alaska Harmful Algal Bloom Network. And then... Um, uh, after Kayla, we'll hear from Gay Sheffield um, to tell us about a workshop that Ahab um, put on recently in Nome. One thing I will uh, mention as well, and um, Joe McLaughlin uh, from Alaska DHSS is on the phone. Um, you know, we had uh, 
we had an event uh, where someone was exposed to paralytic shellfish poisoning just in the last week here in Alaska. And so um, this isn't just an academic um, exercise. There's a real risk to human health. And um, Gay will talk about uh, what people in her region are doing to get ahead of this there where it's a pretty new concern. Um, but throughout, throughout the state, Alaska has been dealing with this for quite a while. And um, Joe may be able to tell us a little bit about, um, about recent events. Thanks so much, everybody, for joining us. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for that introduction, Danielle. Um, my name is Kayla Schomer, and I have been the Alaska Harmful Algal Bloom Network Coordinator um, for about 10 months now. Um, and the Alaska Harmful Algal Bloom Network, uh, as Danielle what said, was formed in 2017, and it was formed to provide a statewide approach to have awareness, research, monitoring, and response in Alaska. Um, and we coordinate a diverse group of coastal stakeholders to address human and wildlife health risks from toxic algal blooms. Um, the network is currently made up of about 75 people and growing, um, which represent over 30 federal, state, tribal, recreational, and educational entities. Um, we have eight, or when the network was started, um, they came up with eight objectives. Um, and the first one is to reduce health risks to humans from um, harmful algal blooms or HABs. Um, to, the second is to identify information needs, data gaps, and emerging HAB threats. Uh, the third is to expand and enhance statewide HAB wildlife and shellfish monitoring. The fourth is to improve effectiveness of and coordination for HAB event response. Fifth, develop HAB event forecasting capabilities. Um, six, improve HAB education and outreach to coastal Alaskans. Um, seven is to unify and build on existing regional HAB networks in Alaska. And the eighth is to facilitate a safe supply of seafood. Um, and our network operates within four working groups in five main regions. Uh, the working groups are communication and outreach, research, monitoring, and event response. Um, and then the five regions that we uh, work with um, each have a, one to a few regional leads to report out um, about what's going on in the network or in their region. And we have a call once a month um, about HABs and the call can include anything from current talks and levels to new research projects. Um, and then we open up the floor to anybody that has any other information they'd like to share uh, network-wide. And our five regions um, currently are Southeast. Uh, we work mostly with um, the Sika tribe in the Southeast um, or sea tour, it's the Southeast Tribal, oh, hold on, up. we'll get back there, hold on. <laughs> um, and then we also work with Kodiak uh, and then South Central and Kashmak Bay and then the Aleutian Pribilof Islands um, and then the Arctic, which uh, Gay will be talking about um, what's been going on up there. Um, we just held a, a workshop in Nome to discuss uh, the potential of HABs in the area. Um, in each region, uh, the organization we work with um, is working to reduce risks of HABs through phytoplankton monitoring, shellfish testing, or both. Uh, but due to the remoteness of a lot of the Alaskan places, um, the communities, and funding limitations, full monitoring coverage is pretty inconsistent throughout the state. Um, but if you have any questions, would like more information, or would like to join the network, um, you can send me an email at uh, Shomer, S-C-H. O M M E R at A O O S dot org, um, and then or visit our website, which I have up on the screen um, right now. I am not sure how to. Oh, there we go. Now it's okay. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks so much, Kayla. Um, Gay, are you uh, ready to speak? No. Okay, if you're on the line, you can be on mute. Yeah, I hadn't heard her voice yet. Normally, she lets us know she's here. Um, I can also speak to the workshop if she is not here. Okay, I'll send an email now, but Kayla, if you want to um, get us started, that'd be amazing. I really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Um, so, uh, last two, two weeks ago, we held um, a two-day workshop um, in Nome, um, AUS and the Alaska Sea Grant co-sponsored it um, with uh, funding help from the U.S. Arctic Research Commission and NOAA. 
and it was a two-day uh, workshop um, to provide an introduction to algal toxins, their effect on humans and marine species, and what we know so far about their presence in Western and Arctic Alaska. Um, and as Danielle mentioned, the, the waters are really warming in um, that region. Uh, and so there's been more frequencies appearance of HABs in the area. Um, we're not sure what that means yet. So this was just a workshop to provide the public and also um, health providers a chance to learn about what harmful algal blooms are, what these symptoms of a, a poisoning look like and how to deal with it. Um, and so the two-day workshop covered the identification of algal species, monitoring techniques, impacts to the ecosystem, and current HABs research results for the region. Um, that included some of the bird die-offs, uh, marine mammals, and then just um, the presence or absence of HABs in the area. Uh, it also included presentations on changing environmental conditions in the Bering Strait, and then the state's role in public health responses to algal toxin poisoning. Um, and then the first day was targeted just for the local um, and public people. And the second day was designed to inform healthcare professionals um, in the regions on the symptoms and how to effectively treat it. Uh, I will be getting out hopefully by the end of this week or early next week, um, a report, a workshop report from that. Um, and it will be posted on the AHAB website if you are looking for more information on it. Okay, thanks so much, Kayla. I appreciate it. Um, and Joe McLaughlin, I know you're on the phone as well um, from Alaska Department of Health and Human Services, and I know you were involved, I believe, in um, the discussion with the health professionals in Nome. If you would like to um, to pipe in and add anything um, to help set the stage for people about the human health concerns and the urgency of this topic, um, you're more than welcome to. Sure. Hi, this is Joe McLaughlin. Um, yeah, so paralytic shellfish poisoning is um, definitely a public health concern here in Alaska. Every year we get, you know, on average about three to five cases. Some years we don't get any cases, and then some years we get big outbreaks or multiple outbreaks where we've seen as high as, you know, in 2011 we had 28 cases that were identified and reported to the uh, Division of Public Health. Usually when we see a couple few cases or a small outbreak, then our surveillance system um, is more effective. People are aware that it's important to report and, um, and also are more cognizant of the mild signs and symptoms. And so our case counts then typically increase during those years. So that's certainly what happened in 2011. Um, we did have one case of paralytic shellfish uh, poisoning here this year already. It's, a, it's a, what I would consider to be a probable case. It's not confirmed yet. We won't get laboratory confirmation for a while from, uh, <clears throat> from our partners that are doing the lab testing at CDC. But in July of 2019, a suspected case was reported to us in a person who ate a single clam, we don't know yet what kind of clam that person consumed. We were notified on the 22nd of this month and um, the incident occurred over the weekend and the person had recovered by the time we were notified early in the, in the week. Um, and the clam was harvested from a beach around Perryville um, and then within about 30 to 60 minutes, the patient had symptoms of paresthesias and tingling and was sent to the hospital in Dillingham for observation. And the patient's symptoms resolved uh, within 12 hours. And uh, we know that APIA has been doing testing. Bruce Wright uh, has been doing a lot of testing in the area and had found high levels of saxitoxin in shellfish um, that he had collected in the area and he had been doing notifications to people in um, communities throughout the region. So it's, it's something that, um, you know, we, have, we feel bad that, uh, that folks, everybody didn't get the message not to consume recreationally harvested shellfish. Now in Alaska, you know, we have a challenge here within the state health department and that challenge is that 
there are no circumstances under which we can say definitively that recreationally or self-harvested or subsistence harvested foods, or sorry, shellfish, are safe to consume because we know that PSP cases have occurred uh, during every month of the year here in Alaska. And the toxin is odorless, it's tasteless, it's colorless, so there's no way to know if uh, shellfish that you're about to consume is contaminated with uh, saxitoxin. And also, unfortunately, the toxin is heat stable and cold stable. So if you cook your shellfish, you're not gonna denature that toxin. It's still gonna be viable. And the same goes for freezing. If you freeze your shellfish before consuming, that toxin is still viable. So our recommendation here in Alaska is not to consume self-harvested shellfish. Um, we do have commercially available shellfish that are tested. Um, and so those are considered safe to consume. But uh, we do have a lot of information on the Alaska Section of Epidemiology's website about paralytic shellfish poisoning. We've got um, epi bulletins that have gone out in the past that show the distribution of cases that have occurred. Um, primarily, the vast majority of cases have occurred in southeast Alaska, south central Alaska, um, into the Alaska Peninsula and the Aleutians. And that's where we've seen most of our cases. Kodiak um, has had high case counts as well. So that gives you kind of a little snapshot and anybody who would like more information about paralytic shellfish poisoning in Alaska and you can't find what you're looking for on our webpage, just feel free to go ahead and give me a call or pop me an email and I'll point you to some resources. Thanks so much, Joe. Um, Meredith, is um, Don Anderson our next speaker? Yes, and we do have a question oh. um, in the chat um, from Toby here. I'm not sure who is best to answer this, but this question is, clams are collected at whales in several other locations. Is there any plans to test those um, before whales area water waters get cold? Joe McLaughlin, I don't know who that would be aimed at, so um, have a specific person in mind that they're asking to? Um, this is Kayla. I'm not sure if there is anybody testing clams up in the Arctic region right now. Um, is that where, I'm sure that's where whales is. But Gay, I think, would be the person that would know. And this is Kathy. I can just say I'll be presenting a little bit. We're going to be getting some bivalves and things to test, but it's not in a monitoring capacity. So it wouldn't be, you know, testing specific beaches where people are harvesting. It would be opportunistic samples taken on cruises that I'll, I'll describe later. Okay. Well, we can um, continue try to try to get that answer that question answered in more detail. And um, Toby, if you put your email address uh, in the chat, then um, we can get it to the Alaska Harmful Algal Bloom Network and get you in touch with somebody who um, can help get an answer to your question. Great, and I see there's a question from Will too. I think. I know Don is on a time crunch, so we might move to Don and then we can um, answer Will's question um, as we go. Okay, we ready? Okay. Yep. All right, let's see. <clears throat> I'm trying to share this. This worked before.
Okay. Do you, you nobody sees it, right? Oh, see I just me. did, and now it's gone. Should be this screen here. Now you're sharing. Okay, I can't tell, but I see you, but let's. Can you see it now? Yeah, I think if you did click the, um, like, the full slideshow. There we go. Yep. Have you, have you got it now? Okay. We all set? I make sure everyone can see and hear? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's good. All right. Well, to just very briefly give you some, some background, we've, you've already heard some about HABs. Uh, I won't go into great detail other than just to point out a few points. They are truly a global, a global problem. They're increasing in many countries and many areas. We already know the negative impacts are public health threats like those you've been talking about, but there's also significant ecosystem damage, uh, economic losses from these types of uh, problems. I've listed just five of the uh, human poisoning syndromes that you can eat from tip you can get from typically eating shellfish sometimes fish um, there are many other types of habs but these are the ones we're worrying about in Alaska and and of these uh, the ones that are in red are the ones Alaska really needs to worry about PSP we've already heard something about ASP or amnesic shellfish poisoning is uh, an, a, a human poisoning that, that can kill people, but it also, one of the symptoms can be permanent uh, memory loss, permanent short-term memory loss, because there's actual damage to uh, portions of the brain from this toxin. And the very same toxin that causes ASP, though, can move through the food web and cause mortalities and damage in the, in the food web. And so it's not appropriate to call it ASP, so they're often referred to as DAP or demoic acid poisoning. So the, the, those are the two toxins. Saxitoxin that causes PSP, ASP, and demoic acid poisoning all caused by, by the demoic acid. And in terms of the projects that we've been running, and I should say these are collaborative projects with, with Bob Picard uh, helping me with the physical oceanography as, as well as some others. Kathy, you're going to hear talk about uh, some other work right after me. Um, in terms of background, uh, very little is known about HABs in the Arctic region in particular. Uh, it's PSP is a well-known phenomenon here in the in the southeast and in, in parts of the Aleutians and the Pribilofs and it's uh, but up further where we've been looking like from the Bering Strait up into the Chukchi and the the Beaufort Sea is, is very very little is known and and this map on the right I don't know whether Kathy was planning to show it I'll be very brief uh, Kathy published this great paper that showed algal toxins, the saxitoxin in blue and the demoic acid in, in red, in 13 different species of marine mammals representing a variety of habitats, a variety of, 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 of food web uh, transfer processes. And, and it's clear that these toxins are up there in, in throughout Alaska and that warming ocean temperatures and decreasing ice cover are, are going to expand the, both the temporal and the spatial window of perhaps in the Arctic. And therefore, human health and ecosystem impacts really could be significant, particularly because this is a region, especially to the north, where traditional monitoring programs for toxins uh, are either not feasible or where there's essentially uh, little uh, experience with toxins and HAB dynamics in the region. So we've been trying to look at the distribution, stru community structure and dynamics of two species that are responsible for these problems. Uh, Alexander Catanella that causes the PSP problem and the Pseudonychia, a group uh, of species within the genus Pseudonychia uh, there in the Bering, Chukchi and Beaufort Seas. And we've done this through several cruises that we've joined, uh, Healy 1801 and 1803 last year. And to give you some real quick data from those cru cruises, which we think is, are, are extremely interesting and, and surprising. Um, I guess though first, let's look in this lower left 
panel and you see the life history of Alexandrium catenella. And what it does is it, uh, it is a cyst in the sediment most of the year throughout the winter. And then that will germinate and produce what we call vegetative cells that are photosynthetic that swim and they become the bloom that can be the source of, of the to toxin problems. But then those cells will produce uh, what are called zygotes and those zygotes fall to the sediment and become those cysts. Now the, this map on the right then shows the cysts in the bottom sediments collected at these various stations with a big hot spot as you see here in Ledyard Bay. And, and a number of things are really important. The, these red circles, the bullseyes within this, uh, this seed bed as we call it, are, have extraordinarily high concentrations of Alexandrium cysts, as high or higher than I've seen anywhere else in the world. And we've seen a lot of places in the world. And uh, notice how though it drops off rather sharply heading towards the, the Bering Strait and also towards the Beaufort Sea. So it very much is a, a seed bed. Now, if you look at the insert here, it shows the, in the, um, the, the red shows the cyst concentrations on this line, this Ledyard Bay line. And in the blue, the blue line shows the temperatures. And when you get up to six, eight, even nine degrees, these cysts can germinate very readily. If it were less than two degrees or very cold temperatures, uh, they, will, they will take months and months and months for a, a cyst to germinate. But at these temperatures, they'll germ, germinate quite rapidly and asynchronously. And that's a, that means you can have localized population inoculation in that region. Now, in the same cruise in 1801, this now shows the cells that are in the water. So now we're looking at what's up here in the, uh, in the, the surface waters. And again, there's a bullseye here uh, showing in roughly the same area the cells in the water column, grading the very low densities in the Bering Strait and low uh, as you head towards the Beaufort. And if you look at this diagram that Bob Picard pr produced, uh, there's a strong association of the high concentrations of cells with the uh, Alaskan coastal current water. But basically what we're seeing is um, these concentrations we measured up there are well above the levels that can cause dangerous toxicity in other regions. We, two, three, four hundred cells per liter is often enough. A thousand cells is certainly enough to make things dangerously toxic. And we're seeing 5,000 cells per liter or more up in this bloom. Uh, the sea surface temperatures there are in the range that are very uh, supportive of growth of this organism. And we do, do see that positive correlation between the cysts that are right below this bloom and the bloom very much suggested that, as you see in this bottom bullet, blooms in the region may well be locally originating and therefore likely to be recurrent events that you drop new cysts after each bloom and they're there to start something next year. Now, let's look quickly then at uh, Sudanitia. These are data from Kate Hubbard. There's a lot of information on this slide, but what you can see in the map are the color codes of where various uh, uh, Pseudonychia species were detected. And you can see well up into the Chukchi Sea, these red bars here are representing Pseudonychia australis, which is one of the most toxic, if not the most toxic Pseudonychia species we know of. It causes problems out here in the East Coast and it caused a big outbreak along much of the U.S. West Coast in, in 2015. And now you see it being present in this bar chart all the way from the Nome area in the Bering Strait all the way up here into DB04 almost to the DB05 line. So you've got a, a toxic Pseudonychia there. This green bar represents another, this is Pseudonychia pungens, also quite toxic, covering that same region. And there's this uh, light blue that you see then stretching all the way as we go over towards the Beaufort um, is another organism, in another species in Pseudonychia that's toxic as well, but not quite as toxic as the others. And then all the grays and blacks are species 
that we don't even know their names and we don't know their toxicity, but, the, but they're, uh, they're potentially toxic and we just don't know it. And those are all the ones that are far off to the east. So the Pseudonicha story is very clear that you've got some very toxic Pseudonicha there, uh, predominantly in the Chukchi and areas towards the, Be the Bering Sea, uh, a lot of unknown species off to the east and some mild, more mildly toxic ones in, in the middle. So to wrap up then, what are, what are we going to do going forward? Just in the next uh, week or so, the Healy 1901 cruise will begin. Uh, some of my, my people are on that. We're gonna try to get the same information of the sediments and the water column. So we'll see whether we can document another seedbed and another bloom. Bob and I have a NSF funded uh, HAB dedicated cruise planned for 2020 that will be around this same time. That you see in the map over here, those are the, the stations we're going to be running to not only map out Alexandrium and Sudanich as well as we can, but also to understand the, uh, the physical structure and, and the dynamics of, of those blooms. Um, during that cruise, we're also going to be looking at uh, why that's such a hot spot, but also the connectivity between all of these populations using a variety of tools. Uh, how much do the populations up here in the north uh, relate to and are connected to the ones in the southeast Alaska or the ones we find over in, in Russia and in Kamchatka? Um, how much is there a transport of those populations to the north versus a, a localized development? Those are some of the key questions. We also are going to try to look at the sediments to see if we can uh, go back and see the history uh, and the, uh, of these uh, cysts in the, and cells in the region. In other words, are they, are they recent introductions or are they, uh, uh, they've been there a long time? And uh, I've also we are working and will try to help with efforts to model and predict the Arctic HAB bloom dynamics and the food web transfer, transfer of toxins. So I'm going to, to stop there. I have some bullet slides that, that just uh, summarize that clearly HABs are, are already in the Arctic, likely, likely to become more prevalent. prevalent. We have found an extensive seed bed. Uh, we do think blooms are originating locally and likely to be recurrent. Uh, we don't know if these are recent phenomena or have been occurring for many years, but not, or have, have just haven't been noticed. Uh, multiple pseudonicha species observed throughout the Arctic, and uh, some of which are highly toxic. So these all these results just have significant implications for Arctic food web dynamics and and public health. So with that, I'll I'll stop, and I don't know whether you want questions now or move right to Kathy, but either way. Um, maybe in the interest of time, we'll move on to the other presenters and then we can circle back um, with questions for everyone during the discussion period at the end. Hey, um, uh, Danielle, can I just mention something quickly? This is Bob Pickard at Huey. Um, sure. I, I have to jump off the call uh, before the hour's over. But um, that map that Don put up, I just wanted to point out that, that he and I put that map together as a tentative sampling, sampling plan. So, you know, we are fully planning to adjust or adapt uh, based on what we see while we're out there. So I just wanted to point that out. That's great. Thanks so much, Bob. So uh, I believe Kathy Lefebvre is uh, up next on our agenda. Kathy, are you ready? Sure, yeah. Let me uh, share my screen. Thanks. I cannot share until Dawn is done sharing. <laughs> okay. We should be able to share now. Yep. Almost there. Okay, we're seeing the slides. Seeing a slide? Okay. Okay, this is perfect to follow on after Dawn. Um, so we are, we have kind of joined forces, uh, Dawn and I, and put together sort of an even larger scale sampling by taking advantage of uh, various cruises of opportunity 
to get uh, the phytoplankton samples that Don was mentioning, so phytoplankton samples, sediment samples for cyst counts, and then we're going to be adding on the other trophic levels. So in the same places that we're getting the phytoplankton and the uh, cyst counts, we're uh, going to be taking zooplankton samples, uh, fish samples, bivalve samples, we have people in place to take marine mammal samples, etc. Um, and so what I thought I would just share with you really quickly is sort of the plans we have for this summer um, and the uh, opportunistic cruises that we have and the samples that we're planning to get from these um, regions. So this first slide is kind of a, a summary overview of the team that we've put together for this EcoHab grant proposal that we wrote that we do not know yet if it will be funded. It's going to be considered an FY20. But because we put so much effort into getting it organized and getting all the partners together um, and have momentum, we're taking advantage of at least getting these samples this summer uh, on the cruises. And so it's a lot of volunteers and um, et cetera. And, and some uh, funding from uh, folks like uh, Dawn's group that already have some things going and Steve Kibler and um, other folks. So if you look at this map, this is just a list of all the team um, that's been assembled so far. We have something like 30 established collaborators and 12 established co-investigators. Everyone is welcome who, who wants to play a, a part in this sort of overview and modeling effort. So I'll just quickly show you. Uh, Don already talked about his Healy cruise. He's getting phytoplankton and sediments. And then we've also arranged with folks on there to get zooplankton samples and bivalves and polychaetes and fish from those same places where uh, Don's group will be characterizing the bloom densities, et cetera. Um, we have the Arctic IERP cruises through the Eco Foci group at the Alaska Fishery Science Center in Seattle. They go out, these are for other uh, purposes, it's for fish counts and ecosystem management stuff and the chief scientists are listed here. Um, and so we're hopping on that cruise with a volunteer and we're going to be getting phytoplankton samples that we can then send to Don's lab and to Kate's lab for the Pseudonychia and Alexandrium analyses. Um, we're getting sediment samples so we can do cysts as well. And we're doing zooplankton sampling, bivalves, polychaetes, and fish again on this cruise. And if you look at the, let's see, it's three legs. The first leg are these sort of green stars and triangles that go all the way through the strait down here near uh, St. Lawrence Island. The second leg is up here and the third leg is here. So we got some pretty comprehensive coverage um, for this. And, and this is an, also in the system where we have samples that we'll be able to get, oops, uh, from the bowhead whale harvest through Raffaella Stemmemeyer in the North Slope Borough and the Alaska Eskimo Commission there. And these are some of the samples. Oh, yeah, I already said that. Okay, so then we also have the North Bering Sea Cruise, which is done by the Alaska Fisheries Science Center Ock Bay Laboratory uh, in Juneau, their ecosystem monitoring and assessment program. The chief scientist is Jim Murphy. Um, we'll be able to get phytoplankton sediments and fish from this cruise and this is going to be really valuable because we'll be getting some uh, sediments from areas where we don't haven't had them before to look for cysts. Uh, we're also going to be on the Southeast Coastal Monitoring Cruise and this is down in the Gulf of Alaska in the Southeast Alaska. Uh, also the Ock Bay Laboratory we're going to be getting phytoplankton sediments and fish and then the Western Gulf of Alaska, again with the Eco Foci Group at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center. These are the chief scientists. We're going to be getting zooplankton and fish along this area. And so I guess what I should mention is why are we getting all these samples? Why are they valuable? Basically, we're going to be able to determine bloom densities. So how, what, how, how big are the blooms? Where are the blooms? Where are the cysts? What kind of toxin levels are in those blooms? And then we're going to be tracking the toxin through the food web. So we're going to be measuring toxin levels in the zooplankton, in the bivalves, in the uh, polychaetes, in the fish, and in the marine mammal samples that we get um, from all of these regions this summer. Um, and just, I'll just put here, how are we getting our, our marine mammal samples? 
We have the many partners that I showed, uh, the Alaska uh, Marine Mammal Stranding Network, the Alaska, uh, or the uh, Bruce Wrights Group. We have the uh, uh, subsistence harvested ice seals, walruses, uh, fish and wildlife, et cetera. And we have a program that's called the Wildlife Algal Toxins Research and Response Network, or Warren West, listed here. So that's how we got the data that we showed in the map that Don just showed, where we looked at 13 different species of marine mammals. That was actually analyzing a thousand animals from all those regions around. Um, so we're all set up to do that. We'll be getting subsistence harvested animals as well as stranded animals in the regions where we're getting all these other parts of the food web. So again, the goal is we're trying to get a little step closer to generating a model that will tell us that make it predictions about under what bloom scenario would we get toxic levels in the food web that would be harmful to fish and marine mammals and also obviously people. Um, and we're, the modeling effort can also include some physical factors and we're trying to think about how we might include something like um, ice cover or um, temperature in these models. How might that impact the severity of a HAB in a certain season? So that's kind of what the added value onto what Don has already been starting in terms of looking at HABs and showing that the cysts are there and our work showing that the marine mammals already contain some of these toxins. Now we're gonna try to get really at the model of what are these densities and how toxic are they? And then the last thing I'll show is uh, we also got a small little uh, grant for uh, addressing the multi-species die-off that is occurring right now or has been over the last month. And this map just shows, this is by Rick Toman, um, shows sea surface temperatures in the region of the multi-species die-off. So up near Norton Sound and um, the Strait area and those X's show where we have already, or where Gay Sheffield was able to collect samples for us um, to try to look at the role of uh, the potential role of harmful algal bloom toxins in this die-off. Of course, temperature is playing a role, could be starvation, other things, but we wanted to take advantage of this opportunity to get these samples and see what kind of toxin levels are there, see if they're playing a role. And just to give you some um, idea of the animals, this is a list of the samples that Gay was able to send us. We have some uh, clams from the region, krill, a uh, bowhead whale sample, ring seal, several walruses, a minke whale, um, and some of the other uh, ice seals. And so that's, that's really all I had to, to share right now. Um, if there are any questions or however you want to move on. Thanks so much, Kathy. That was great. Um, Meredith, could you, uh, um, Kathy, if you could stop screen sharing, if Meredith would put the agenda back up for everybody to look at, that would be great. Okay. Am I still sharing? Okay, hold on. <laughs> Maybe. Thanks so much, Kathy. Yep. I'm trying to figure out how to unshare. Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Meredith, is Kathy our final invited speaker? Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So, w what I might like to do at this point, um, because we've only got um, 10 minutes left in the scheduled call, and Meredith has let me know that she can keep the line open for an additional 15 minutes if the discussion is going, people want to continue. So, I might just um, direct your attention to some of the um, questions that uh, we shared on the agenda for folks to think about in preparation for this call, and then we can just open it up to discussion and, and let the conversation go where it will. Um, so some of the things we thought about were um, how can ongoing projects contribute information that's relevant to plankton bloom dynamics to help us provide some early warning of potential blooms, um, because we know that cells bloom under relatively warm water conditions, can we identify some sources of data for things like surface and bottom waters that could help uh, provide some information um, about when blooms may be triggered, either um, cysts in the sediments or um, blooms in the water column? Um, how can the sea ice community uh, and uh, provide information relevant to water column stratification and bloom dynamics? How can models, particularly those that assimilate data in real time, be used to address this issue? 
How can communities participate in local monitoring? And can we use tools like the existing local environmental observation or LEO network to share observations? So those are uh, just some things we wanted to throw out there. And I think we'll just open it up for general discussion and see where it takes us. So thanks so much, everyone, for participating. And I, I really want to thank our speakers um, for really doing an amazing job at setting the stage for this discussion. Thank you so much. Donna, if you're still on the phone, there is a question from Kelly asking about whether freshwater input has any impact on cyst germination. Yes, I'm, uh, I'm on my phone now. The, uh, the answer is not, not really. These cysts are at the bottom of the, you know, of the water column and uh, they're, they're really totally removed from freshwater inputs down there. The, 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 there is a link though between freshwater inputs and the growth of the organism. Uh, once it's swimming in the water, we find that uh, river runoff in particular tends to not only help stratify the water where th th this organism really likes stratified waters, but also, I'm talking about Alexandrium here, and, and it, um, it also likes some of the constituents that are in runoff, some of the humic materials that can make the water sort of brownish in color. Those, those are actually quite stimulatory for growth. So the effects not on the cysts, but on the, uh, on the vegetative cells in the water column. Uh, hi, this is Bob Pickard. Uh, Don, I got a question for you. Um, in your slides, you showed that the, um, in the hot spot in Ledyard Bay, that the uh, biggest concentration of cysts were a little bit uh, farther onshore uh, than the uh, amount um, of toxins in the, in the water column. Uh, that was a sort of a, the hot spot or the maximum mm -hmm. amount were further offshore. And uh, I was wondering, you have any thoughts about that? And, and perhaps could that be related to the nutrient distribution? Um, you know, because we know that the farther offshore you go towards that sort of central channel region, you tend to get some higher nutrients than you get in the Alaska coastal water, um, you know, as part of the ACC. You know, th this is a question that I'm hoping you help me answer uh, someday. I noticed the same thing that the cysts are, that the, the bullseyes aren't exactly one on top of the other. They're close to each other, but the cells in the water column are a little further offshore. And, and so there's, you could explain that several ways, uh, one being nutrients, like you, you said. Another one might simply be physics. I mean, these cells have to swim from the bottom up to the surface waters as, after they germinate, and the wa those layers are moving in different directions. And so by the time they get up in the surface, they are not likely to be sitting right over where they started. This isn't, this isn't a lake. This is the ocean. It's, it's, uh, it's moving. So uh, it may well be a, a physical explanation of where they are transported to and where they are nutrients that, that defines that offshore uh, off offshore bloom versus the more inshore center of the uh, of the cyst deposit. And actually, I'm going to use this question. I know there are people here from the sea ice community, maybe wondering what is it that they know or could know that could be of help to us. There's actually quite a lot, and I, I would love it if somebody would uh, get in touch with me <clears throat> that is knowledgeable about the dynamics and the the motion and well the motion of the sea ice the duration of it it's i can't go into details here but i have just a a hunch that there can be a a linkage between uh some of this heavy cyst uh deposition and the location of sea ice um, at different times especially towards the end of these blooms so um that's probably sounds like Greek, but basically these, uh, these cells, as much as they're swimming in the, in the water, as ice begins to form, if the cells are still there, there are mechanisms where we could actually have 
uh, enhanced cyst production, enhanced, uh, well, production that then might lead to deposition when the bottom of the sea ice melts and, and uh, reforms. And so uh, there, there actually is a potential link between the, the cyst part of our story and sea ice. There certainly should be one between about sea ice and the plankton blooms as well. But uh, there's, there's definitely some grounds for some interesting discussions if people are interested. So, so Don, this is Jackie Richter Mengi. Um, thanks for for explaining the connection that you see with regard to sea ice. I have a question then. So, in addition to the duration, are you considering the fact that these cysts would be incorporated into the sea ice cover when it grows in the in the fall, and then um, stay there through the winter and and be there uh, to to um, germinate in the springtime? Thanks. See, that's that. That's exactly what I mean. There's there's two sides to what I was driving at. One is how do we get so many cysts on the bottom, and there may well be a mechanism for sea ice in that. Um, it's it's complicated. I won't go into it here, but um, in that case, it would be more that the cysts form or sort of they either form within the sea ice or they're they're trapped in it, and then as that. Uh, forms uh, melts and reforms, which I gather it does at the bottom. Um, you you could actually have uh, this these cysts dropping to the bottom, but the, also the ones that are still there um, are are going to survive. They're uh, they they would then be available in the next uh, spring or summer to germinate. So you could well have blooms that start from the top and the bottom of the water column and no one's ever looked into that and it's something we're very interested in. Um, this okay, is Bill yeah. Adams. I have, I have a comment on sea ice and phytoplankton but it relates to work that was done quite a long time ago um, with an oil spill test in the Beaufort Sea and um, the thing that I noted as the principal investigator on this was that in the parts of the test where the oil had been spilled intentionally, we found in the spring uh, a much more vigorous algal growth than in the controls. And I wonder to what extent the potential that might exist for, for oil spills actually stimulating algal growth, either in the spring melt period or even during the open season when there's very little ice present. I don't think this has been looked at very much and currently I've been involved in uh, looking at standards for um, environmental monitoring connected with offshore oil development in the Arctic and it's one of the areas that I think might be of interest in terms of what this might mean in terms of HABs because Certainly, we found the, uh, the a nutrient from the oil actually stimulated algal growth. Not, it didn't suppress it compared to the, to the controls. So I'll just leave that hanging and see what people might have to say about that. Well, this is Don Anderson again, just very quickly. I, honestly, these species that we're worried about the most, the Pseudomitia and the Alexandrum, I don't think I've ever seen a study about the effect of hydrocarbons on their on their growth. It, it may be out there, but I'm not sure I've, I've ever seen it. Uh, on the other hand, there, there are a number of algal species that are what we call mixotrophic. Um, they are able to use carbon in, in different forms, whether it's particulate or dissolved. So there is certainly um, there are, there's, there's precedence for there being some sort of a stimulation of that in that regard, um, but in, uh, that's about all I can say. I don't really have much to offer. Uh, that's useful, thank you. Hi, uh, this is Joey Comiso. Uh, can I make a comment about sea ice? Uh, hello, uh, yes. can you hear me? Sure, yeah, sure, go ahead, Joey. Yeah, we, we have uh, comprehensive uh, sea ice cover 
And in fact, uh, we have a website at NASA uh, in Neptune, and I'm sure some of you are aware about that. And uh, we have a weekly representation of uh, uh, sea ice cover, surface temperature, wind, uh, phytoplanktons, and maybe uh, some of these blooms, harmful blooms that are discussed here can actually be detected just looking at the uh, plankton distribution as observed by satellite in the Arctic region. And uh, that can be used to maybe start uh, warning communities about the, the possible uh, presence of uh, uh, harmful algal blooms. I was just wondering to what extent uh, this uh, satellite data is useful for the community. Thanks for that, Joey. Um, you, you do have some really great resources uh, there from the satellite imagery on the NASA website, the NASA DBO site. Um, John, if you're still on the line, I thought you might like to respond to that. I know, um, I, I believe it was you I've heard say in the past that for Alexandrium, for example, the, um, the concentrations in the water column that can produce dangerous toxins are such that, um, that they may reach that concentration well before any kind of bloom would be ev evident from satellite imagery. Um, is that correct? Uh, yes. The, basically, for Alexandrium, satellites are not going to be useful. Uh, at the densities that I, that I, ooh, the densities the density that I described, that I wait a minute, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting feedback, feedback here because I, I think, hold on, I'm on my <laughs> phone and my computer at the same time. Okay. Um, anyway, the densities that I described uh, are such that you'd need about a thousand times more cells to be visible from space. So they're still very, very dangerous when they're dilute. For Sidonicha species, for the ASP problem and demoic acid poisoning, we, uh, we don't, it depends on how toxic the various forms are. Those blooms might be more visible from space, but it's not a, it's not a guarantee. So there would be many situations where the water would look blue and harmless that could, they could still be very dangerous. Uh, but on the other hand, there, there may well also be major blooms of at least Sudanicha that might, where that might actually help. But it's really quite rare for blooms of Alexandrium to get to the point where you've got red water and long before you got to that point, the water was already very dangerous. Uh, <clears throat> do we already know uh, the origin of this uh, blue? Uh, maybe with satellite data, we can trace that? Well, it's, a, it's the very Plus same. I mean, uh, somewhere or? Yeah, it's a, it's a very same story, though, that if you're really trying to trace the origins, the only way you could do that if there is a dense bloom. So if, if for example, there were a dense bloom down in Nome or off of, you know, the south of the Bering Strait, and you could then conceivably track it north into the Chukchi, but it would already have to be a very dense population. And, I, and again, I, it doesn't happen that often with Alexandrium, so that it makes a visible red water condition. Uh, so it's uh, maybe with Sudanicha you could do something like that, but I really don't think it's going to be informative soon enough with Alexandrium. Don, this is Jackie again. I just wanted to let you know I, I'm going to talk to uh, our sea ice uh, coordination team or collaboration team after this, and maybe we can get uh, some dialogue going, some more information from you that we can send out to the the team and, and try to get you connected with some folks that might be able to answer some of your questions. 
Great, and thank you for that. And just another little note that one of the things we'd love to get, especially during these coming months, would be samples from the bottom of sea ice. Uh, it's it's hard sometimes when you're on a boat and trying to, to get some of the the ice at just the right place in the right time. But um, I, there's other people who are that's their main focus and. If they can, if they talk to us, we can tell you exactly what we would need. It, it could be really quite informative. Okay, we'll see if we can make some connections. Great, thank you. You're welcome. This is Danielle Dixon. I also um, wanted to throw out there that the Marine Ecosystem Collaboration Team and the Modeling Subgroup have been talking about how we could um, advance um, modeling capacity for biogeochemistry in these models that look at atmosphere, sea, ice, ocean um, interactions and feedback. And um, so we had a, a couple of calls last year and we're planning a couple of more this year um, for those of you that are interested. But one thing that occurs to me is, uh, Don and Bob, if you're going out in 2020 for a dedicated uh, half cruise, it might be worthwhile um, thinking about what sort of um, process study that could include that would help us get at some of the, um, you know, some of the nuances that you might need to include in a model, a biogeochemical model that are specific to these um, uh, Alexandrium and Pseudonychia so that you might have uh, better capacity for including that in models. So if you're going out there making some measurements, um, might you be able to do some experiments on board that would help you really get at, at um, the parameters you would need to build an informed model? I'm not sure if, this is Don again, I'm not sure if Bob is still on the call. Uh, to, to do a model of Alexandrium, uh, the first thing we would need is is a very well constrained, well-calibrated physical model of the region with reasonably high resolution. So uh, if, if somebody is running that, running that operationally, that would be a huge first step. Uh, and it wouldn't involve any new measurements or anything other than perhaps to calibrate it and to, to see if the model is able to recreate the observations, the physical observations during the cruise. And then after that, it actually is not that difficult for us to take the models that we've developed for the East Coast Alexandrian blooms, which start with a cyst map, a cyst deposition map, just like the ones we've produced up there. And then the germination parameters, we believe we could at least start with the same parameters we've developed using experiments here on Alexandrium from the Gulf of Maine. Um, we've done some studies that suggest that it's, it's going to be the same there that they're just very adaptable organisms and that, that they're going to germinate at the same temperatures at the same rate. So we would be able to take that map, get them to germinate under, using known parameterizations, and then let them grow in the temperatures and the currents and so forth there and just see if we can generate that hotspot. It would be, a, I think, a very uh, straightforward study if there is a good three-dimensional hydrodynamic model to build from. And in that regard, there are people in NOAA in the National Ocean Service who are doing these weekly forecasts of Alexandrium in the Gulf of Maine using the same system I just described. And I've already started talking with them about what it might take to try this on the West Coast. But the stumbling block so far has been trying to get a, a model. It, it is, I'm sure there's something, there's a mo probably multiple models that exist there, but we haven't gotten that far yet. But I, I actually think we can do much of what we need uh, with, with data we already have, as well as some physical, you know, hydrographic calibrations during the cruises. Great, thanks. And if, if you keep an eye on the, um, the agendas for the um, marine ecosystem calls, you'll see, um, when we're going to be having those discussions, when you might want to join us.
So uh, does anyone else have anything with, you'd like to add to the discussion before we wrap up the call? Um, this is Meredith, and I just wanted um, to uh, let Don and Robert know that uh, they've probably got some chats privately um, in their chat box um, requesting more information or suggesting help. So just uh, looking at those. And Meredith, can you let folks know how they can um, go back and have access to the chat uh, after the webinar is over? I know we have, we'll make recordings of the webinar where you can see the visuals and the audio after yes. the fact, but how would folks access the chat? So um, the, I will post the link in the chat box for the um, webpage for this event. And I will post the notes as a comment on that web page and a lot of the information captured in the or from the chat will be captured in the notes all the relevant information there will be in the notes and that will be where the recording is um, I'll get um, the slides from Don and Kathy those will be there also great thanks Meredith uh, and I know we've, we've got um, some folks uh, participating that, that I've, I'm not familiar with. It may just be that you're associated with a different collaboration team that I don't engage with every month. Um, but I'm, I'm excited to, to meet some new people on the line. And um, if, if you don't typically participate uh, in an IRPIC collaboration team, if you would please add your email address to the chat box um, so we can make sure that, that um, we circle back with you to, to invite you to, to join uh, one of these collaboration teams. We'd love to um, have you participate more often. So, and uh, with that, I think I'll thank everyone for participating. Uh, huge thanks to our presenters. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to share your information with us, and we hope that you get some valuable feedback from folks who participated in the webinar. And this will, uh, recording will be available, so, um, and it'll be available not only through the IARPIC Collaborations website for people who are members, but it will also be available to the public on YouTube. So please feel free to point your colleagues, anyone you think may be interested, to the recording. Um, and uh, we look forward to continuing this, this conversation. Please reach out to the collaboration team leads uh, if you'd like to see us uh, have some follow-on webinars to kind of build off of this conversation. It looks like there's a great opportunity for the CIS team to, to look at how they could, could get involved. And uh, speaking for the Marine Ecosystem Collaboration Team, we're, we're very happy to hear from you about directions you'd like to see us uh, continue this conversation. So thanks so much, everyone, for participating. And uh, we look forward to seeing this conversation continue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.